but thank you. <clears throat> uh, thanks, everyone, for, uh, for coming today. Um, we're going to hit on a bunch of topics, uh, I guess, in the next 45 minutes or so. Um, I made the mistake this morning of going back and reviewing the email announcement for this and all the topics that I was supposed to cover and uh, added more slides, so I went from 30 slides to somewhere above 40 this morning. But um, we'll get through it. So is everyone familiar with anaerobic digestion? Have some, some idea? I've got some heads that are shaking now, um, so we'll just touch on that quickly. Uh, anaerobic digestion is a biological process. It happens at a relatively high temperature for, for biological processes, uh, mostly around 100 degrees, though it can go up to 130, 145 Fahrenheit before we start to see uh, decreased performance. Um, it does occur in, in a, without oxygen or an atmosphere without oxygen. So you see typically digesters you know, will have less than 2% oxygen inside of that space where, where the activity is going on. Uh, it is naturally occurring. Um, works very well with organic waste to convert those waste streams into what we call biogas. And biogas is a mix of methane, uh, which is the major component of natural gas, and carbon dioxide as well as some other trace gases. So it is a, it is a means for us to produce um, renewable energy uh, from that carbon that would normally be driven off as, as carbon dioxide or methane. Uh, digestate is the other product that we that's generated. Uh, and that is a mix of water, undigested solids against biological process, so it's not uh, perfectly efficient. In fact, if we break down anywhere from 30 to 70 percent of the organic matter in a, a waste stream, we've done a good job. Uh, there's also a lot of nutrients, minerals, and other stuff mixed in there. So it is a very uh, good fertilizer material. Uh, the problem is it's very dilute because it is typically 80% water or more. Uh, most often, most digesters are going to operate at a, about 10% solids or less, so you're looking at 90% water. So the difficulty with digestate is really the water fraction. And as I said, it is best suited for, for slurries or for liquids. Um, you know, we can do digestion up to maybe 30% solids, but once you get about 30% solids, really there's other uh, waste to resource technologies that are probably more appropriate. In the most part, generally, digesters are going to operate between 5 and 15 percent solids. The reason we do digestion is, is a, a variety of things. Renewable energy, of course, is probably the one that gets the most uh, publicity on it. But it is a good way for odor and emissions control. Uh, and that's actually why a lot of our dairy farms have, have gone to uh, digestion. It's also good for carbon recycling. So we, we were able to to maintain those, those carbon molecules uh, and, and reuse that element over and over again. Waste stabilization is a common use of anaerobic digestion in municipal wastewater treatment plants. Um, what we've seen recently is it's become really uh, a, a key technology for the management of organics that typically would have gone to wastewater treatment or landfills. Uh, and as I was telling Tom before, Many, or not many, five or six states in the last two years have adapted landfill diversion bills where they're disallowing organics in the landfill, or they're, they're banning uh, the dumping of organics into those landfills. And so as those bans take effect and as they start to scale up, there's really not a lot of options on where you're going to put those organics other than probably compost, uh, direct land application, or anaerobic digestion. And so uh, as we see that momentum around the country grow, this landfill organics bans, uh, we may see you know, more interest in anaerobic digestion. Uh, again, this is an example, one of the benefits I didn't have on there. When you talk livestock manure, there, there's a huge benefit in the, the reduction of weed seeds. So we actually deactivate, or during digestion, the weed seeds are deactivated or become part of the food source for the, the microorganisms. And when you apply raw manure next to digested manure, give it a few weeks to see if there's any germination, you can see a pretty big difference. And this is a picture that we took on campus uh, two summers ago on a wheat field. So this was manure that would have been applied in July and August. They went back in September, October and took pictures. And we really didn't see much uh, germination of weed seeds. So uh, there are real benefits and, and, and measurable benefits beyond that of just uh, the energy side. So if you'll bear with me for a few minutes, I'm just going to give you a little background on ADREC and, and uh, what my day job is. Um, I'm in Biosystems Engineering at Michigan State. Uh, ADREC, or the Anaerobic Digestion Research and Education Center, was formed in 2008 
as kind of a partnership between MSU and a, a private uh, donor that had interest in this, this topic area. Um, and so they committed funds to build a facility uh, and hire some faculty and some students and do research in this area. Um, and so for that, those funding, that funding lasted about three years. So since 2011, uh, we've continued to operate through a variety of different mechanisms, grants, fee-for-service work, uh, as well as some, some general funding from the university. But the focus of ADREC is to look at novel ways to recover uh, waste and to turn waste into resources. Anaerobic digestion being kind of a cornerstone of technology, but not necessarily the only technology or not necessarily always the appropriate technology. Uh, but it just happens to be the one that was the, the founding, or the, the core when, when the center was founded, so it got uh, first, first play in the name. Uh, we do have a high bay kind of pilot space where we work on commercialization. Uh, we have pilot reactors. Most of the work that's done here is, is pilot scale. And so we do, and it is all applied for the most part. Uh, we do a little bit of bench top work, but most of it is applied. I'm the manager of the facility, so I sit here on a daily basis and oversee kind of the daily activities and, and coordinate a lot of our fee-for-service work and a lot of our uh, commercial work. The director of the center, Dr. Wei Liao, uh, is also in biosystems engineering and, and uh, is in Farrell Hall, which is our home office. And he oversees a lot of the, the fundamental work and, and uh, the research that's going on in the laboratories at Farrell, which is more, again, bench top. But a variety of facilities here. Um, a lot of work that is done is focused on educating. Uh, and, and with Charles Gould, uh, we do an education program called Anaerobic Digester Operator Training. And over the last six years, we've trained about 150 people around the U.S. Uh, and in Southeast Asia on how to best manage and operate your digester from the standpoint of biology and mechanics. Uh, and so that's been a very popular program. It's been offered about six times uh, over the last six years. So again, just kind of giving an idea of some of the, the different scales uh, that we work at. Serum bottles are what we use typically to screen feedstocks. A lot of the work we do looks at, you know, we have a waste stream. What needs to be done to convert that waste into biogas and digest it. Is it digestible and what is the biogas potential? So a lot of that work is done at this scale uh, and then we have other facilities that, that complement that. Way, a lot of his work is focused on microbial analysis, microbial community analysis. So again, looking at what are the, the different microorganisms involved in this process. It's not just one, um, one bacterium or protozoa. It's a mix of, of different microorganisms uh, that slowly break down through really four or five different steps. Uh, you know, a piece of glucose and, and, or a protein and convert that into the, the methane and, and carbon dioxide. And so, again, trying to find ways to optimize it, looking back at the, the community that's involved and trying to isolate and identify certain microorganisms that, that really play key roles. Uh, so there's a lot of work that's done between biosystems and environmental engineering uh, at Michigan State on this. Again, waste to resource. Uh, the digestate coming out of a digester can become feedstock for algal production. And so again, finding ways to convert that, that digestate, which has a lot of nutrient value, but because of the, the form that it's in, really is, is kind of a liability for most operators. Uh, algal production may be an opportunity to use that uh, and convert it into a, a saleable byproduct or saleable end product. System integration is, is a big focus of what we do. Again, looking at ways to tie anaerobic digestion or some other waste to resource, waste to re, uh, waste energy technology um, with microbial processes, with solar energy, water recovery, uh, and, and, and additional byproducts or, or bio byproducts uh, that we can that we can sell and, and generate revenues from. And this is kind of a lot of the the focus of what we did in Costa Rica. And I'll go into a little bit more detail on some, some additional slides on that. Again, system integration. Uh, we, we've got numerous systems that we've integrated on campus to address some of our livestock waste management, along with some of our campus-based food and organic uh, waste management. Adrex sits here. This is the MSU Dairy Farm. Uh, we have a, a large compost facility where we compost most of the, li the livestock manure, the dry livestock manure. And adjacent to that, we built a research digester in 2010, which is actually a 250,000-gallon uh, digester, so it is a, a fairly sizable unit. And then in 2012 and 13, we built the new system uh, directly north of that. So we've integrated compost and aerobic digestion to make sure that, or to try and find ways to, to create the most opportunity 
uh, and the best benefits from our, our organic waste from the livestock side as well as the food uh, food waste side from the cafeterias. We have nine, nine dining halls on campus. Probably this week now that the classes are back in full swing, they'll serve about 150 to 160,000 meals. And the food service on campus is all, for the most part, buffet style or, or quick made to order meals. And again, our population is 18 to, to 21 year olds, uh, and so their eyes are always pretty big. We actually generate per student or per, per uh, patron at our, our restaurants a pretty high food waste. Uh, to, to individual ratio. Uh, at a household in the United States, you know, about six tenths of a pound of food waste is generated per person in that house uh, across the United States. Our students are doing that per meal. So <laughs> when we look at food waste on campus, uh, it is actually a, a, a sizable number, um, and it probably is that way at, at most uh, universities in the U.S., but it's something that has, our sustainability office has been very sensitive to. So we have our, our South Campus Anaerobic Digester. Uh, we have our large algal ponds, our, our research digester, and then uh, some solar, some, some thermal conversion, and then now we also have combined heat and power at the site. So Costa Rica, and I'll come back to this in a few minutes, but over the past three years, we've developed with the University of Costa Rica solar biopower generation system. It's supposed to be a model system for uh, Latin American countries, and it integrates uh, solar power as our heat source, because again, digestion occurs at high temperature, um, with uh, a thermophilic anaerobic digester operating at about 42 degrees centigrade. Uh, the energy then goes into to small generators, so the biogas is used to power small, uh, actually just home-styled generators, but again, each one 16 kW, so we can produce up to 32 kW at a time. And then the water, or the digestate, goes through a series of four sand filters and, and uh, biological wetlands to get to near discharge quality waters. Again, energy, Costa Rica is doing a great job as far as green energy goes. A uh, very high percentage of their power comes from hydro and wind, but a very low percentage of their water, about 3% of their wastewater in the country is treated before it's discharged. So finding ways to combine energy recovery as well as wastewater treatment uh, is a real need for Latin American countries. And then, again, part of our, our you know, working with, with private sector, we do develop pilot systems uh, for uh, other commercial entities. And this is a unit we put together that was shipped to Singapore this summer. We have three pilot scale digesters in this shipping container. Uh, and they were looking at testing wastewater treatment technologies, ways to enhance biogas production from municipal wastewater. And so this has become a fairly big piece of our, our outputs. Uh, we're building right, uh, another system right now for the Department of Defense that's looking at treating wastewaters uh, at forward operating bases. Again, that's part of a project with, with Dr. Liao, uh, but again, another containerized uh, pilot system treatment system. So we do offer a whole host of services, uh, anything from feedstock testing to biogas analysis to pre-feasibility work, um, and, and this has really become a, a big piece of our sustaining uh, uh, revenues. And uh, we work all over the U.S. Uh, on projects and in, in, in support roles, as well as in a number of countries around the world. So the Costa Rica project, I think, is a good example of, of some of the different things that we do at ADREC in, 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 the, in the space with anaerobic digestion. Uh, this project was funded by the Department of State uh, under their Energy and Climate Partnerships for America. And it brought together multiple faculty across the university, as well as multiple faculty faculty from the University of Costa Rica. Um, the goal was to develop you know, and integrate small-scale, uh, sustainable waste to clean energy systems that can produce these value-added products. Um, and, and clean water from the wetlands was our target for value-added product. <coughs> so here, we're looking at that overlap. You know, we've got waste coming from livestock as well as uh, other sources. Again. Costa Rica is a nice model country because they do have a tremendous amount of export of fruit and vegetable products. Uh, they are our, our primary source of pineapple and bananas for the United States. So uh, they've got a lot of processing in country as well as a lot of packing uh, for export. And, and both of those uh, processing as well as packing generate tremendous amounts of organic waste. And so we looked at the overlaps between those and the best ways to generate bioenergy fertilizer 
uh, have an impact on greenhouse gases and then generate clean water. The, this project had four objectives, the first one being looking at that microbial community uh, component and, and seeing how the microbial, com the microbial community in Costa Rica differed from the, the microbial community that we have in East Lansing. Again, very different uh, climates, and so we'd expect to see some differences. We also looked at operating the digesters in the two different uh, temperature regimes. Mesophilic around 100 degrees, and then thermophilic uh, upwards of 125 to 135 degrees Fahrenheit. The second objective was to design and implement a system in Costa Rica, uh, and that was done at the Fabio Badret Experiment Station. Uh, we spent a lot of time evaluating the technical and economic performance of that system, and then to establish an outreach program. And this, this project actually did branch into uh, Panama uh, with Unachi University there, and then into Nicaragua with Leon. So we did cross the three, the three border countries, or the two border countries. Um, the outreach program has a English portal and as well as a Spanish portal, and, and that's available through the EDRIC website or through UCR's websites. Um, as part of this, we did also develop a joint study abroad program where students with Michigan State are, are teamed with students from UCR to do a study abroad looking at ecological engineering issues uh, in tropical climates. And the second uh, version of that just came back on Saturday. So we had about 20 students that participated in the 2014 uh, study abroad, the, the previous one had about 14 students in 2012. Um, so this has become a, a, a big piece of our, our study abroad activities, but also this interaction. And, and even though our project ended uh, at the end of the fiscal year, in, last year, we've continued interactions and, and are working to develop a, a center similar to ADREC, where you can do fundamental research, you can do applied research, and you can do uh, fee-for-service or commercial work. Um, and partnering with you know different entity, different government entities to look at wastewater issues, and then also bringing in the private sector to look at ways to utilize byproducts. Uh, coffee is another big product of Costa Rica, and the coffee industry is very engaged in looking at ways to utilize uh, the the hulls and the mucilage generated from uh, the coffee stripping process when they're getting to the actual cherry or the bean or the, the, or the bean uh, inside of the cherry. So. Um, really engage with the coffee industry there. So a little bit on, on this, again, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but they did look at, you know, startup time. Uh, you know, when we, we start cold with the digester, it's a biological system. It does take time to acclimate to temperature and feedstock, and, and that consortium is going to adjust to the conditions that, that uh, uh, are best. And so we looked at, you know, startup time on different digesters uh, using different ratios of manure to food waste. So we went from 100% manure to to 80% manure and 20% food waste. Uh, and these, this was kind of an arbitrary choice. Again, our permits in the states uh, would allow a traditional farm to go 80-20 blends. Uh, so that's just what, what set the goal here. And again, we did look at it across two different temperatures um, as well, and with the two different uh, communities, the blue being Michigan States or, or, or something in our northern climates, and then the red bars there being uh, the local uh, community from Costa Rica. Um, we looked at biogas production, and again, you know, different ratios, different time frames, uh, and then how they differed across the two different uh, the two different regions. And, and some differences, and again, there's uh, there's probably four papers that have been generated on some of this research. So to go into a lot of detail in a short time here um, would be quite difficult. Um, Looking at, again, biogas production, also related to solids volatile solids reduction. So, again, the, the carbon in our biogas that is the, the methane and carbon dioxide has to come from someplace. And it's coming from the volatile solids and the organic matter in those waste streams. So we should see correlations uh, between these reddish pink bars uh, and our blue bars. And so when we do see you know, very high levels of, of solids reductions, uh, we generally would expect to see, you know, a, a, a linear relationship there in biogas production. And then this is just one slide on on that uh, microbial community work that's been done. Again, looking at just digesters with chicken manure, dairy manure. Um, I'm not sure. Oh, oh, chicken manure and dairy manure from Costa Rica, and then dairy manure from Michigan State. 
looking at those uh, with blends of food waste at different temperatures uh, is what the other things are. And so we do start to see uh, differences forming in those communities inside in the predominant uh, microorganisms that are involved. And it is on there, but um, you know we do have really two dominant forms, uh, but then we do see some slight differences uh, on those more on those minor bacteria and in microorganisms, which is what we'd expect. The the system integration there again, because this is part of a as, as much as it was a research project, it was also intended to develop industry there. Um, and so what we did when we put together this pilot system is we worked with locally manufactured equipment. And again, being a big coffee producing area, uh, they do have a very strong manufacturing base that builds small scale uh, grinders, separators, storage bags. Um, they do burn a lot of uh, the, the, the hulls that come off of uh, coffee beans and so they've got ways to, to convert organic matter to, to thermal energy. So we utilized a lot of a lot of the different parts locally. The only thing we couldn't find in Costa Rica was actually the engines, um, but we did bring those out of Brazil, where there's a company there that modifies, you know, standard gas uh, or kerosene generators to run on biogas. So these units will start on on gasoline or kerosene and then switch over to biogas. But we've got a grinding apparatus, so our feedstock comes in, and the feedstock in this case is is a mix of, of chicken manure, dairy manure and then whatever fruits and vegetables are, are available from the local packing house. And so you may have whole bananas, you may have pieces of papaya and mango, but everything that goes through a, a hammer mill to break those particles down, again, one of the keys to, to biological conversion is providing surface area for those microorganisms to work. And so generally we're trying to grind materials or, or chop materials uh, as fine as possible. And a hammer mill gets us relatively fine, I think our our diameters, maybe it was about uh, 3 16 of an inch was our screen size on that. So we were able to, to shred material pretty well. Um, we had a 20 cubic meter digester or bioreactor. So we were feeding this digester roughly one ton a day uh, of material. And that was allowing us then to generate um, 32 kilowatts of, of electricity for about an eight hour window, which is what their normal work day would be at this experiment station. Uh, and 32 kW of electricity is just slightly below their peak demand. So we were able to, with, with one ton a day of organic waste, some from the experiment station and then some from the, the neighboring packing house, uh, to sustain their electrical needs uh, pretty closely balanced. We did, of course, again, biological system is generating biogas 24 hours a day year round. So we did have a, a fairly sizable storage container that allowed us to, to store biogas and then use it uh, when it was necessary. If we were generating too much biogas, we did have the option to, to, to burn it through a flare. Again, methane is a very strong greenhouse gas compared to carbon dioxide, so we never want to release methane directly to the atmosphere. If for some reason the, the engines aren't able to run in this case, uh, all the gas would at least go through the flare and just be converted to carbon dioxide, um, and, and we would still see an overall greenhouse gas reduction for the site. So. Um, a fairly simple system, but uh, for for the region it's in, you know, relatively complex at the same time. There are a lot of anaerobic digesters in Central America, Latin America, but they're more of this bag style where you would actually have the digested material in the same bag as where you're storing gas. Uh, and, and in those cases, that bag is never really insulated. so. Uh, you have a lot of temperature fluctuations throughout the day. Even though Costa Rica is a relatively warm climate, nighttime temperatures do dip quite a bit. And so you would see easily um, inside of a, a bag digester like this, you know, a 10 to, to 25 degree temperature change uh, through the course of 24 hours. That's a pretty big uh, fluctuation for, for, you know, this microbial community. And so, you know, in these untemperature controlled systems, uh, that are just really working in ambient conditions, we don't see really good conversion and we don't see really clean, uh, high quality, high volumes of biogas being produced. So by keeping this system at a steady 42 to, to 50 degrees C, I think most of the time we were operating at 42, uh, we were able to produce uh, very clean biogas, 65 to 70% methane, uh, in, in large volumes compared to a conventional system. So, you know, looking at uh, that mass balance, that, that techno-economic side, again, are we getting good conversions? 
Uh, are we being efficient? Um, there's more, a lot more literature that's been generated on this. There's a couple of papers that are in review right now uh, looking at kind of the mass balance of the system and the overall performance of the system compared to more of the conventional or the normal uh, technologies that are out there. And we did see benefits, of course. Um, looking at the conditions, comparing our laboratory, again, laboratory, always ideal conditions are there. We can provide the optimum source. Uh, we were able to produce roughly 1,000 milligrams or milliliters of, of biogas per gram of total solids. When we went to the field conditions at scale, again, a ton a day, we were about 866. So we did see about a 15% drop off, just under 15% drop off going from laboratory to, to kind of commercial scale uh, conditions. Uh, not too bad, and, and typically this is as we work with uh, developers here in the United States. When we provide data coming out of our lab, we would, you know, they're going to um, offset that or reduce that somewhere between 10 and 20 percent, depending on their their tolerance for risk. There, so um, this was good to see that that uh, we're right in that ballpark of of about a 15 percent uh, uh, a loss due to, to field conditions. So I'm going to switch gears now and talk more about digesters here in Michigan, kind of where that we are as a state. And I think where we are as a state is pretty reflective of where we are right now in the United States or North America, um, with the exception of, of Ontario. They're kind of uh, their own world right now when it comes to biogas. And then uh, as I get a little farther in, I'll focus in on, on R2 digesters on campus and kind of the performance that we saw uh, in 2014. So does anybody know what this graph is? is this is oil over the last five years. And so uh, this is kind of probably a good depiction of how the digester industry in the United States has gone too. It's, it's been steady, but not really you know, increasing. It's just been consistent for the last five to 10 years. Uh, but I think now we've really seen things probably drop off along with uh, most renewables due to low oil prices. So again, yesterday we were looking at $45 a barrel. Um, that, that has really uh, set us back quite a bit when it comes to, to biogas. Now, <clears throat> the biogas that we produce typically in the United States goes to electrical production. Some of it is upgraded to, to pipeline quality methane. Uh, most of that pipeline quality methane work stopped when natural gas prices came down a few years back. Uh, the technology is still there, but a lot of that's just been mothballed for the time being. Um, and, and those that do have kind of biogas cleaning systems or gas upgrading systems uh, had actually looked at converting that gas to comp compress natural gas and then and then uh, switching over their vehicle fleets to run on that. Again, you're still competing against very low uh, conventional energy prices there, so that's that's also a pretty hard play right now. Um, we had one new system go online in uh, 2014, uh, and I'll talk more about that in a second. Um, and I'm not sure if there's any systems in Michigan planned for, for 2015. When we look at across the United States, uh, agriculturally we've been building on average about 10 to 20 digesters a year uh, for the last 5 to 10 years. We've also seen about 5 to 10 digesters go out of service. So uh, we haven't, we've seen just a little bit of a steady growth but not really anything uh, drastic. Um, Ontario uh, the province has seen a pretty drastic growth in digesters, uh, but they've adapted just in the province a feed-in tariff uh, comparable to that of Germany. And so they're getting paid uh, through that feed-in tariff process a very high value uh, for their electricity, um, probably on the order of somewhere uh, between 25 and, and 32 cents U.S. Uh, per kilowatt produced. And here in the U.S., um, we have seen contracts as high as 16 cents, though most of the time contracts for electricity in the U.S. are about uh, 8 to 10 cents per kW. If you're operating outside of a contract, you're, you may be getting uh, as low as 4 to 5 cents a kW for your electricity generated. So, uh, you know, that doesn't generate a lot of revenues. Uh, most of the digesters that we have operating in the U.S., uh, especially the livestock ones, are also bringing in organic waste from outside sources, food processors, uh, grease trappers, um, partnering with biodiesel producers to utilize high energy feedstocks uh, that they can collect a tipping fee from, but they can also boost their energy production without really changing the infrastructure much. So they can do a small addition of, of outside feedstocks, you know, 5 to 10 percent, which really has a pretty small impact on their volume, but has a 
pretty large impact on the amount of biogas that, that they can produce. So, uh, in food processors, you know, again, it's pretty stagnant growth on digesters there. Uh, they're generally implementing them as pretreatment for discharge to, to sanitary. Uh, so not a lot of focus there. And, and the same on municipal wastewater. Again, not a lot of anaerobic digesters being installed uh, at wastewater treatment plants. Activated sludge and, and aeration processes are still the, the predominant use there. In the state, uh, we've got, I think, seven farm digesters now operating, which are the Red Stars. Um, we have really four and there's actually a couple in the UP, five or, or two more in the UP, that are wastewater, municipal wastewater digesters that are actively uh, seeking out ways to utilize their biogas produced from their existing digesters, or uh, looking at ways, or, or they're actually already doing it. Benton Harbor is probably the best example. Uh, they're using a lot of their biogas that they're producing at the plant there to run gas-powered pumps. So they're directly burning it to run pumps on site. Uh, which is a pretty efficient use of it because you don't have to have the interconnections and a lot of the electrical service work there. Um, Flint is the other one that's gotten a lot of attention over the last five or six years and they're uh, developing anaerobic digesters inside of old tanks at the Flint wastewater treatment plant and then bringing in uh, high value energy feedstocks, high value organics to, to boost gas production and then using that gas production directly on site to run a generator to produce uh, electricity as well as hot water to drive their wastewater treatment processes. The blue dots are some of our food processors that are running anaerobic digesters as pretreatment processes. So they're running digesters at their site to lower their BOD levels before they discharge. Some are using the biogas uh, for beneficial, again generally burning it in a boiler to produce hot water, though a few are just simply flaring it to, to off gas and destroy any odors that may be attributed to it. So that's kind of the state of where we are in, this, in, in Michigan. The project that went online in, in uh, 2014, or at least was, was near con completion of construction, was the Lowell project. And this is a public-private partnership between Lowell uh, Light and Power and Spark out of Grand Rapids, where, where they developed what we call, or what's called a UDR uh, digester. And this is you know, three or a combination of fixed film towers. So inside of each of these towers, and this is not Lowell, this is actually a, a similar system in Germany, but these are packed with corrugated uh, tiles or corrugated plastic material to increase the surface area. And by doing that, they can allow these micro, these uh, microbial communities to actually adhere and attach and stay inside of that digester. And by running dilute, dilute material through there, they can get a very high and a very quick uh, destruction of that organic waste. You know, when you look at a complete mixed digester, which is probably the most common, if you put a gallon in today, it's going to stay there for 20 to 40 days. In a, in a fixed film system like this, if I put a gallon of, of material in, it's probably coming out of that fixed film system in the next 24 to 48 hours. So now we can drastically shrink the footprint. Um, it's best used for materials that are really 98% water though, so you have to be very dilute and you generally want your organic waste to be dissolved or very, very, very fine particles. But these towers are packed with media and, and they create a biofilm in there and that biofilm is what's used to, to treat and to convert that organic waste into biogas. So this system is UDR, upflow, downflow, and then reflow which sends some back. But there's a tank that's not shown and there is a complete mixed digester that sits on the back end. The, the complete mixed digester is really acts as two things. One, it's a continuation of, of the digestion process that, that starts here. It also provides the, the plant storage capacity. So again, they can then store material for you know, up to six months and, and just work on that volume in there. Uh, the Lowell system is, is set to produce about 800 kW of electricity, and they're using a very um, high energy mix of uh, waste cooking oil and grease as well as a little bit of dairy manure and a little bit of food waste. And the dairy manure in this case really is what provides that microbial community. The, the same uh, micro, microflora in the stomach of a cow is really what's growing in most of these systems. And so by every day putting in a little bit of manure, you're actually re-inoculating the system daily. It's not required. You can actually run these without manure at all. You just have to be very tight on your process control so that you don't kill off or change the, uh, the chemistry or the chemical nature of the, the 
material enough that that community dies. But by adding manure in every day, it provides you a good buffer, and it also provides you a new stream of, of microorganisms in case something is having a negative impact in there. So biological systems are very sensitive to the sun changes in temperature, sun changes in feedstock blend, uh, as well as any kind of antimicrobial compound that may get into the system. So um, this is a, a kind of a, a summary of what that Lowell project looks like. Um, should be a very nice project for the community there. 2014 also saw another program, and this is more on the policy and the regulatory side. Uh, Consumers Energy entered into agreement with Michigan Public Service Commission to develop what they call this Experimental Advanced Renewable Program for Anaerobic Digestion. And what this did was create a mechanism for digesters to get long-term 20-year contracts for energy sales, uh, which is good. One of the challenges with it is the price was only $86 a megawatt or 8.6 cents a kW, which is okay. Um, most, most experts probably would say the break-even cost for biogas, for, for electricity for biogas is on the order of 10 to, to 12 cents a kW, so we're slightly below that. Um, but the program was offered, this was the first uh, really digester-related program that had been offered since 2007. Um, they did offer a second option where they could do, where, where uh, an owner could do 10 to 20 year contracts with escalation, and those rates, you know, changed, started at, at 76, and then if they went into it for a full 20 plus years, could get to $106 uh, out there in 2038. They had four farms enter into this. Uh, they wanted 2.6 megawatts of total electricity, that's what they got. We had three existing systems that were operating without contracts. This was a good opportunity for those uh, three farms to jump back in. And we have one new system uh, that, I'm sorry, so this would actually be one that would be built new in 2015. So over in Coopersville, Beaver Creek uh, is a greenfield site that has accepted a contract on this and, and is making preparations to, to go into construction. And again, this project is also, uh, SPART is also involved with, with, with the development of this project. <coughs> so. At Michigan State, we, of course, do a lot with anaerobic digestion. Um, is there a clock in here? How am I doing on time? <coughs> okay. Um, so we really got heavily involved in anaerobic digestion in 2008. Uh, 2010, we built our first systems on campus. But our, our the university's history, of course, is much longer with digestion. Um, I was involved through the university with the development of a project at Green Meadow Farms near Elsie in 2005. So we've been involved with very large-scale projects for close to 10 years now. Um, the system we built ourselves in 2010 is what we call our, our research digester. This is just a simple plug flow digester. Uh, it's more or less a big concrete shoebox, and it has a, 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 a wall that divides the shoebox in half that extends about 75% of the length. We put material in uh, on this end, and it goes down, and then turns and comes right back out at the same end. Um, you can see our, our gas bubble on top, so we're producing biogas. Uh, and this was this was developed through a, a research project with Michigan Public Service Commission, um, and this is built for roughly 100 to 100 to 100 to 200 cow dairy, which is the range of the average dairy cow, dairy farm in the in, in Michigan, um, and it's a relatively low tech, low cost digester that. It is effective at producing biogas, reducing odors. Um, doesn't generate a tremendous amount of gas. If we put a uh, electrical generator on this system, we could support about 70 kW of electrical production. So this has been running. We actually took this out of service. We had some problems with our gas collector last summer, so this has actually been decommissioned uh, and will probably be brought back online in the summer of 2015 when when we replaced the the gas collector on top. So. I guess our lesson there is we went just a little too low tech on, on that piece of it. You keep uh, running between KW, like 70 KW, do you mean uh, kilowatt hours? Kilowatt. The generator capacity is just KW. Okay. okay. When you run it for an hour is when it becomes that KWH, right. kilowatt hour. So a 70 KW unit running for 24 hours would produce 24 times 70 kilowatt hours. So you can run it for 24 hours. Mm -hmm. Correct. In 20, 
12, we were approved to build what we call the South Campus Anaerobic Digester. Uh, this is a much larger scale project and had a very different focus and vision than the research side. This, is, this project was intended for mainline waste treatment. Uh, research can be done on this project, but it really is not intrusive research. This is a complete above ground system, 400,000 gallon tank, that we call a complete mix. So in the plug flow, there's no mixing at all. We, we just pump material in, and it naturally is going to flow out to the outlet. Uh, of course, there, you get separation and settling, and, and lots of things occur in that. This tank is circular uh, and has two mixers in there at different elevations and with flexible angles. So what we call this crock pot you know, should be stirred and should be homogeneous top to bottom, left to right throughout. Uh, we also, because when we built this, we drastically changed how the dairy farm manages their manure. And so what we did is we abandoned uh, all the underfloor storages at the MSU dairy and replaced it with one large uh, 2.1 million gallon storage tank. This is done to comply with EPA, with, with uh, the NPDES permitting process that there is in the state. Um, if anybody was on campus in roughly September, October, or April, May, and you oversmelled anything really bad on Grand River, it was typically those underfloor storages. So it also addressed by, by taking and abandoning those under, around storages and replacing it with a digester that reduces odor and then a covered storage tank. There's virtually no odor at the dairy farm now, and, and you definitely don't get the seasonal application odors that we did uh, that we had years ago. With this system, we also put in place a combined heat and power unit, a CHP. Uh, we can generate up to 400, 440 kilowatts of electricity every hour. Um, we also collect thermal energy off of that. And so we're able to produce enough thermal energy, more than enough thermal energy to, to, to sustain our operating temperatures of our digester. You know, it's, this morning it was minus 12 or minus 15 in Lansing. The digester was still operating at 102 degrees Fahrenheit. So even though we have all sorts of seasonal changes outside, uh, because we have a nice insulated digester with a tremendous amount of thermal energy available in the form of hot water, uh, we have no issues uh, maintaining temperature throughout the year. Electricity from this system is, is funneled into eight to ten different facilities on South Campus. So what we're doing is we're offsetting power that we used to purchase from consumers with our own green forms of energy. Uh, the thermal energy, as I said, is used for the digester. It also supports some, some buildings that are in the area. Um, we don't, it's not affordable to, to transfer hot water, 190 degree water, very far. So the distance we can go with this is roughly 200 feet before we really start to see uh, drops in temperature that make it ineffective. The digest state from this goes through a solid separator. The solids become part of the compost stream, and then that liquid uh, goes into storage and becomes fertilizer that's land applied seasonally. So looking at the, the front end of the system, the white tank is insulated, that's the digester. Uh, gas pipe on top, you can see the yellow gas pipe that comes off, and then the big green blackish tank in the back with the, the gas holder uh, is the, 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 digestate, the liquid digestate storage tank. Looking down, this is the combined heat and power unit. It's a containerized unit with a 12-cylinder engine in there um, that runs strictly on biogas. Uh, we have heat recovery. On the exhaust, we have a, a flare that's integrated again in case our, our generator is out of service and we're producing gas, we still need to destroy that gas. Um, and the way these generators typically work, or at least this, this form, they are tied into the grid. And so they need the, swap, the sine wave coming from the utilities in order to integrate and operate. So when consumer's energy is out of power or, or there's a black, blackout condition in the area, uh, this unit is cycled off. So then standby generators kick on and we can at least uh, combust and destroy the, the, the biogas through the flare. We have gone through uh, some hiccups and some challenges, uh, probably more than what we expected, but not necessarily unexpected that we'd have some. Uh, we've seen challenges really with our, some of the process design. And, and we have pipe sizes that are really uh, a little bit too constricted for the, the type of material that we're digesting. Again, we're digesting a slurry of manure and food waste um, that you know, can clog relatively easy. And even if you demand that the people that supply you feedstocks, our dairy farm and uh, the other ones, provide clean organic waste, there's always things that make their way in there, whether it's a rag, a sweatshirt, a uh, cleaning brush, there's always a little bit of debris that gets in there 
and, and when your pipe sizes are so small or you have so many 90s uh, in, a, in a close proximity, uh, clogging becomes a major issue. And that's really been our, our biggest challenge over the last uh, uh, two years. This system was commissioned in October of 2013. So we're just a little bit over a year into to operation. Uh, also struggling still in our operator time. Uh, originally, the company that built this for us forecasted one hour a day to two hours a day of operator time. Uh, through most of 2014, we were eight to 10 hours a day. And so we've, we've done a lot of things over the past three or four months to improve operations and, and bring that operator time back down. Um, we're comfortable that we can get it back down to four hours a day, uh, which is actually what we had planned for. So we're, we're getting close to that. I think uh, by the end of January, uh, the, the changes will be done so that that operator time is about four hours a day. We've got a mixer that continues to fail. So we have two, two mixers in our, in our big tank, our 400,000 gallon tank. Uh, we operated about four months of the year with both of those running. And then eight months, uh, we, were, we were operating on one system, on, one, on just one mixer. And that does have an impact on performance. Uh, these mixers are not electrically driven, they're actually hydraulic mixers. And so we continue to, to have just a little bit of an issue with an oil leak. Um, and a little oil leak or a little drip on a hydraulic uh, fitting is, turns into a big problem relatively quickly. So uh, we think we know what the solution is and we're just three weeks away from getting that one fixed again. Um, from our standpoint, we're now taking in more feedstock than we expected, so our, our receiving area is undersized. Uh, we've had freezing issues. Of course, last winter was extremely harsh. Uh, we learned a lot quickly. Uh, controls continue to be a bit of an issue. We get a lot of lockouts and we get a lot of false alarms. Uh, debris in a feedstock is always a challenge. And a big challenge that, that has kind of caught us off guard is our feedstock characteristics are not what we originally thought they were or we were told that they were going to be. And we also see some differences in our, in our quantities from what we expected. And I've got a couple of slides on those. So when we planned this system in 2012, we expected to use about 40 to 50 percent dairy manure, which of course is right there on campus, 7,000 tons a year. And then fruit and vegetable waste, uh, Meyer has a distribution warehouse in Lansing. They cut pineapple for all of their fresh market areas. So that generates a pretty large volume of chunks of organic, or uh, I'm sorry, of Meyer, of, of pineapple uh, skins and husks. So that was expected to be about 4,000 tons a year. Fog, this fat, oil, and grease material, this is waste material from restaurants uh, that can't be used for anything beneficial, biodiesel production. Uh, we were expecting about 5,000 tons of that. And then our own campus food waste, 500 to 1,000 tons of that per year. So all in, uh, we were looking at about 16 to 17,000 tons a year of feedstock. And it came, and it was expected to come to us in all forms. Small carts, roll-offs, tankers, um, and generally very, very clean. You can see here, this is primarily pineapple, but somebody threw a trash bag in there. Again, that happens on a pretty regular basis, uh, not just with this material, but with all, all of our sources, including our dairy manure. So given that recipe of about 16 to 17,000 tons a year, uh, the company that contracted for us projected about 3,000 megawatt hours, I'm sorry, yeah, 3,000 megawatt hours a year of electricity or 3 million kilowatt hours per year. Um, again, we devalued that a little bit, so we were gonna be happy. Our pro forma said if we could hit 2.2 million kilowatt hours a year, we would be doing fine. Um, this is about 7% this is about of our energy transition plan for this year. So it did make a little bit of a contribution to our sustainability goals, that of the university. We also have approximately 3 million megawatt hours a year of, electric, uh, of thermal energy. We have some greenhouse gas reductions that account to about 5,000 metric tons a year of carbon dioxide reduction. We're diverting, our goal was 10,000 tons a year from landfills. And then of course, uh, recycling of those nutrients and fertilizer values and then education outreach opportunities of course are very important. So this is a chart of our food waste deliveries for 2014. Um, manure actually fluctuated quite a bit throughout the year. I'm not sure if our cows went on vacation in July and August. Um, you would think that a cow is a cow and she produces the same amount every day, but something was going on throughout the year that we did see peaks and valleys. Um, the red line is fog. Again, we see a little bit of seasonal change there. On a, on a monthly basis, of course, these are much smaller in comparison to what manure was. Uh, the fruit and vegetable waste is our, our third largest delivery. And then kind of coming in here at the bottom is, is our own campus uh, food waste. And so all these points are monthly delivers tons, tons per month uh, of material delivered. So 
What actually happened was we saw more manure than we expected. We almost we saw more than double the, the manure that we expected. So that once this got running, they brought the dairy manure to us, and then all of a sudden we got beef manure and a little bit of other manure. So our manure values jumped uh, quite a bit, which is fine, uh, but manure is not an energy-dense material. It's already gone through a, the gut of the animal, so most of that easily available energy is gone. So, you know, this is good bulk material, but not energy-dense material. Our fruit and vegetable waste is about 1,000 tons off of what we expected a year. So, you know, this, this dropped quite a bit from what we had projected. Again, fruit and vegetable waste, high in sugars, high in uh, star starches, uh, very good energy conversion, but we're down in, from what we expected. The fog, uh, again, down a little bit, uh, but not terrible. The problem with the fog is, oops, we expected and we're told we would receive fog that's 20% solids. Again, we need organic matter, not water. What we're actually receiving is 2%. And so this has been the biggest hit to our overall energy production for the last year. Uh, campus food waste, just a little bit under what we expected. Uh, 430 tons in 2014. So, um, you know, more manure and really dilute fog are, are kind of our two stories for the year. The reason these other materials are so important, when you look at the gas production potential uh, cubic feet per ton, manure is down here at the bottom, about 30 to 50 cubic feet of, of uh, biogas potential per ton. Fog, on the other hand, you know, very, very high energy density, uh, depending on the, the solids concentration. Um, food processing waste, also very, very high. Fruit and vegetable waste, much, much higher than, than manure. So this is why we're so reliant on these outside substrates, because they are very energy dense uh, compared to the manure that's very microbial dense. Uh, and so this is what has driven us to underperform a little bit in, in 2014 along with a lot of the mechanical changes. So I put these together last night. Actually, um, the red line here, this is our target for uh, feedstock on a monthly basis. Of course, because we had so much manure coming into the system, we were always, almost always well above our, our target. When we look at electrical production, this is our target, about uh, 26 or 2700 kilowatts. Oh, I'm sorry. About 183,000 kilowatt hours per month. Uh, we were generally below that, and at different times of the year, we were farther below than than, on, on, than others. Overall, for the year, we averaged about 80% of our target. Uh, and again, we had a mixer, issue, major mixture issues, a lot of clogging issues, um, and we had a feedstock blend that was much less energy dense than what we anticipated. So. The fact that we operated at 80% was actually above what I had projected. I thought we would be at about 70% of our target, so we did a little bit better. Uh, and I believe by early spring here, we will be at 100% of our target or, or slightly there above. So we're, we're in good shape. The system is working well. The digester itself is performing extremely well. Our methane concentration of our biogas is always 63 to 65%, uh, which is a very high. Uh, compared to a typical dairy digester, which would run 52 to 55 percent, so we're doing we're doing overall very well. Uh, we've got the mechanical issues being resolved, and then uh, working out the, the feedstock deliveries and the feedstock energy densities. Uh, just another chart again: organic loading rate uh, is our, our green and blue line. So again, we do see a lot of variability on those 70 averages throughout the year, and then uh, the green and red lines are organic loading rate. And then electrical productions. Again, we see a lot of starts and fits. Um, we did run into a nice, steady, you know, relatively smooth range there uh, through the summer months, and then we've had some mechanical issues with our, with our combined heat power unit that have caused us to, to be down, especially quite a bit in November. So uh, just another trending pattern that we're looking at for the year. So I mean, overall, in closing, the, the, the digester industry probably is not very healthy in the United States right now. Uh, but we have a lot of good success stories that are there. And in this relationship between organic waste producers like food processors and livestock farms that want to run digesters for odor control and environmental reasons, uh, I would expect that we're going to see that relationship grow. Uh, and it's probably going to be driven by these organic landfill diversion bans uh, more than it is driven by a need and a desire to produce renewable energy over the next uh, five to ten years. So. 
Um, with that, I'll be quiet. Spoke longer than I expected, but that's probably typical. So, questions? What is the city of Grantsville doing with the egg that they have? What is, what is that producing? How is it? Is it I, I don't know what it produces. It is a, a different configuration. It's a, it is a complete mixed digester, okay. but by having that egg shape, uh, they're able to get more natural mixing and more benefit of the mixing of just the pumps. And so they don't have to have any internal agitators or mixers in that system. Uh, it's, it's kind of a very traditional design for wastewater treatment plants. Uh, as far as what their energy outputs are, I don't know. And, and, I, and I don't, I mean, I've never visited the site, so I'm not sure what performance is on it as well. I was there before it was finished and operating. And, uh, I, think it, I think it's been pretty successful. Yep. Yep. Have you all done any studies on residential or human waste compared to uh, manure and, and energy? Yes, a, a little. And how does it compare? We're all animals. <laughs> so it is pretty, I mean, probably it, digest a lot differently. So, yeah, you know, there's a lot of other charts out there on this comparison of energy densities. Uh, there's a really good one that's been done out of, out of Germany. You know, when you look at it, and I probably misspoke on, on the, the energy density of manure. Dairy manure is 30 to 50 cubic meters per ton, typically, of biogas potential. Uh, human waste in a raw form would be slightly higher because we're eating a slightly richer diet. Uh, you know, but it's, it is in that same order of magnitude. So you know, we may be 50 to 80 cubic meters per ton of energy potential from human waste, still well below you know, materials that are, are raw in nature. Let me jump to the back first. So what, what source for fog do you use? You said it's restaurant grease, but is, is this coming from, from septic haulers? Is it coming from renderers? Is it coming from... This would be um, septic haulers that are, and this is generally grease interceptor waves, or uh, interceptor waves. Is that protruded in any way, or is it just straight out of the, out of the traps? Uh, <laughs> you don't know. The sample that we were provided that we did our, our basis for our model on had been dewatered. Uh, so we found that out about three weeks into our project after construction, of course. Um, so generally it's raw because again the, the haulers don't want to have all this backhaul and, and you know their, their business is to get it to a treatment or a disposal location as quickly as possible. Um, we are going into discussions now with other haulers, larger haulers in the state that are willing to dewater before they bring us material. But, but generally I mean it's, it's gray water uh, that ranges from 2 to 8 percent solids. Uh, most of that being fats and oils, but some of it's food particulate, and uh, there's a lot of fluctuation between seasons and, and around the year. According to the, the grease trappers, from November to the end of January is their peak season when they're hauling because everyone's going out to restaurants, and that's generally when we see the thickest material being delivered to us as well. In, uh, in paper, waste paper, uh, whatever, could that be used as a feedstock either by itself or in addition to something else? It can be. Um, and we've done a little work with that for, for a group out of uh, Missouri. And actually they were interested in paper as well as cardboard. Um, and it is degradable. It doesn't, it's, but it's not, it's not an ideal candidate. I mean, it's a dry material. Um, and with prints and everything else, you just have a lot of potential contamination concerns there. Uh, I mean, it breaks down. It just isn't. It doesn't convert well. It's a lot of lignin as well, which doesn't also doesn't degrade in the short time that we're in a digester. Uh, the organic waistband. Do you see something like that happen in Michigan in the near future? Um, potentially. There's no I, nothing going on right now, though. No, no the, the the legislature did um, maintain last year the current ban on yard waste. So that had come back up for debate, and there were several hearings that were held, and it was a little bit of a contentious issue um, that you know landfills want that material back in, especially now that they're running gas recovery systems, they want as much organic material as they can get. Uh, but the the Senate did more or less decide not to bring it out of committee, so they did reaffirm that landfill diversion ban on yard waste. Um, you know, I think roads are our biggest topic for the next few years here in the state. I apologize if I missed this, but 
really wasn't clear to me yet. Is Michigan State like with, with the EARP and the Lowell Project and, and even like Novi Energy and stuff like that? Are, are you guys have like the leading edge with working with those companies on it? those groups to kind of develop these processes or are they no so so we would be involved in, in in a variety of different ways and it really depends on the client or the developer or the, the project owner um, with Fremont you know we didn't, were not involved at all uh, with Lowell we did screen and test their feedstocks um, and give them a projection of energy potential uh, but that was more or less it um, with the Detroit Zoo We've actually gone through and worked with them to quantify their different waste streams, characterize their waste streams, and then put together kind of pre-feasibility studies on, you know, what technology is best suited. Because there are, as was brought up in that grant bill, there's, there's probably eight different variations of digesters, from fixed film, complete mix, plug flow, and then different shape sizes, configurations, mixing. So uh, with, the, with the zoo, we, we did look at several different technologies and make a recommendation on uh, what we felt was the, the appropriate technology for them, and then they moved um, moved beyond that with consultants to go into complete building and design drop documents, which we still did consult with them on, but but uh, that was handled by architects and engineers uh, that you know, just are better skilled at doing all of those components. So you know we work in a lot of different forms and fashions with you know it's really whatever potential the client wants. High sugars, high starches, I mean proteins, again, just the really, our, the quickest test would be high COD for us. Um, glycerin from a biodiesel production facility is probably the best product because it's clean, it's pure. I mean, there is some uh, residual catalyst potentially, but that concentration is so low that we don't see any, any inhibition and the energy density of glycerin is, is off the scale. I mean, it really is the, the peak thing. And then that oil and grease, that cooking oil, uh, that's really the next one. Again, it's at high fat levels. But you can't, you have to be measured in how much of that you use too because you still have to provide, you know, the balanced diet for the microorganisms. So you can't run a system on purely glycerin or purely oil. Uh, because your carbon and nitrogen and phosphorus ratios aren't going to be correct and uh, you don't have buffering capacity. To run on just a pure mono substrate like that, you would have to supplement a lot of, of nutrients and micronutrients to make sure you've got a good environment. Do you see any waste from the breweries? And, uh, is that pretty high energy content? Yes. Um, again, Breweries are different though because brewery waste can generally be repurposed for animal feed. And so our philosophy is, and, and most companies' philosophy is, take it to the highest value and or the best use and don't compete in that debate over food or fuel. So brewery waste generally does go to livestock feed as well as a lot of bakery wastes. Um, but certain breweries, especially those in, in southeast Michigan, can't. there's just not livestock farms nearby and there's not a way the brewery waste, again, it's wet, it's, it's biologically active, its shelf life is very short, you know, seven to ten days depending on temperature. So those, that group of breweries in, in the Detroit area are very interested in partnering with digesters. Um, and, and we may look in the next uh, month or so to start taking in some, some brewery waste uh, from those facilities. And then, you know, because we're the closest digester to them right now besides, well, Flint is also there. Um, but really, we're the, the only two that are close by in the state to, to Southeast Michigan. For a revenue model, do you charge tipping fees, or do people pay you to? to um, yeah. To so, we, or vice versa? on that South Campus system, we actually started talking about it in 2006. Uh, and, and if we originally the goal was to be a Michigan State only project, we wanted to bound ourselves to to our campus, to campus. Um, Financially, that model doesn't work. You know, we would produce, we would be able to support about 180 to 200 kW of generation capacity, um, and we would only have revenue from electricity generation. Um, our model that we're running with today and what we switched to in about 2011 and what's made this project go is that we do collect tipping fees. Um, 
Again, if material is going to a landfill, it was paying a price to go to a landfill. If it's material is going to a wastewater treatment plant, it was paying a price. So we have set our fee schedule similar to that of those two disposal options. Um, again, depending on the nature of the material, they may have been paying a pretty high premium to go to the landfill or the wastewater plant because of high solids, because of too much water. Um, but revenues from tipping fees are extremely important to us. I would say they probably make up 30 to 40 percent of our revenue stream. Um, the combination of that revenue as well as the additional revenue from that extra energy that we're able to produce going from say 200 kW to 400 kW uh, is the only reason we we're able to make the project go financially. And, and the, the president said when, when she authorized the project and the, the board authorized it, that they wanted a project that had you know, financial returns the target originally was, was five to seven, um, but that's a really hard target still. So we're, we're in that range of probably eight to ten. Um, we have zero, actually our, our, the, the one thing that's different about our financial model today is we actually charge the project to dispose of the digestate. So even though there's fertilizer value there, um, in front of, from our project there's probably $50,000 a year in fertilizer value, we're actually charging the project roughly $40,000 a year to dispose of that, to pay to have it hauled to, to farms. So if we can flip that number around from a negative cost item to a positive revenue, uh, our, our payback would be right in that seven-year range. The sludge from the municipal wastewater system here is dried and taken to land, land supply. Um, it's a $20 million project right now to upgrade the, waste, the sludge facility. What, is there any way that sludge can be used in the magnet or has already been spent? It could. I mean, it is biological, it's biomass. It could be used. It, it, it is low energy, so it's, it's on that same order as, as manure, human waste. Um, it's not energy dense enough, probably, to, to justify its own digester. Um, you know, we've looked at, the city of Delhi has a digester, um, and they've looked at a drying facility to dry their sludge. Uh, and then they actually wanted to transfer it to MSU and burn it through as a, as a biomass fuel. So, you know, that probably, it has not gone, but that's, that's another option for that sludge. But digesting uh, biosolids um, isn't a big energy generator. But there are pathogen reductions, there are benefits that go along with digesting it. So it's not, uh, it's not unreasonable. Uh, with the project that you mentioned in uh, Costa Rica, how easy is it, um, the concept and systems, how easy is it to apply in other parts of the world? Uh, it's relatively easy. I mean, the, the probably worldwide, the most common digester is something on the order of two cubic meters to six cubic meters, and it's either a plastic bag or a rubber bag or a small fiberglass tank. Um, and they're generally not heated. Uh, there's rumored to be, say, 40 million of these systems in China and another 40 million in India and, you know, a bunch in, in the rest of the world. Africa is a pretty big user. Um, the failure rate on, on those systems is extremely high. And in fact, I was, uh, we just did a project in China in October and I was surprised, but they did report a 65% failure. So, um, having that system in Costa Rica, it probably costs five to seven times more than that simple system. But now you've got a technology that should last you on the order of 10 years, you know, before some of those mechanical pieces wear out, uh, to 20 years on the, the, the poly tanks and the steel pieces are longer. So the life expectancy of that project in Costa Rica compared to the traditional uh, is, is much, much longer. Um, but the technology, again, it's, it's all locally built. Um, it's not rocket science by any means, so it should be relatively easy, easily reproducible. And that was the goal. I'm going to suggest that there are any additional questions that you come up and talk to Dana uh, afterwards. I'm sure he'll be happy to stick around for a little bit. Uh, and uh, meanwhile, let's thank him again for a very interesting talk.